You were talking about the judges, Joanna. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious, were you making any parallels at all between the judge and Sweeney in the, with my friends and this on? They're both sort of ritualistic numbers no. that are... No, I see what you're saying, but no. No, I really, this is merely a, a musicalization of the judge. Every character in the show gets a moment where you get to know that person. So this is the equivalent of My Friends, the equivalent of, of Green Finch and Leonard Bird, the equivalent of Ah Miss, the, or London, come back to London really is what it is, the equivalent of The Worst Pies. Those are all solo numbers. I determined that in a, in a piece like this, I better give each one a solo because it's, all, it's, so, it's so much about the plot that if you're going to characterize that way, you know, ordinarily I would, wouldn't put so many solos in a row just because I was, again, worried about the texture. But you, if you really look at the... At the uh, the first 25 minutes of this show, it's a series of solos. Even though Joanna and, the, and Anthony are on the stage at the same time, she sings a solo, he sings a solo, he sings a solo. Pirelli, that, the square, there are a lot of people, and Tobias has a song with a lot of people, but essentially Pirelli sings a solo. And, you know, Mrs. Lovett sings a solo. And even my friends, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's mostly him. And then uh, a Poor Thing, it's solo, you know. And I thought, oh, God, it's going to be a series of, might as well have people come out in, in one with a microphone and do a concert. So, but I, I, I determined that, um, that it was much more important that everybody should be very clearly characterized for the audience. On the technical level, in the sketches here, um, I was just sort of, this, <clears throat> with with the the D's or whatever in parentheses with the lines between them and then the dots at top, I, I just... Well, the dots at top just means staccato. Okay. So so obviously I had some idea... Going, but it's not over the bump, notes, bump, it's bump. over the... what appear to be the lines. Oh, or, well, the li ah, the lines are just a repeat of that chord. That's my shorthand. Okay. I write a four-note okay. four chord okay. and I repeat it four times, so instead of writing the four notes every single time, I do the four notes and then I go... I that's, would have assumed that's, that if that's it wasn't for the breaking up like that. I guess well, but no, but all I'm, all I'm doing is, uh, I, this D that, that's in parenthesis, I, I would have expected that to be D natural or something. In other words, I would have thought it would be an alternate choice, but I think maybe I was deciding that it should, whether it should be quarter note rhythm or eighth note rhythm, okay. except that I ordinarily would have put little lines there. I don't know. It's interesting. It's, and here at the E, ah, yes it is, because look, you see the E here, has a line above it, which means that I had determined that whether I was going to use, utilize it again or, oh, you know, the other thing it may be is maybe I want the D on top, maybe I don't want the F. The point is this is an alternate to this. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is another, uh, uh, an eighth note. I think it's an, because I would have put a little eighth stem there. So it's somehow an alternate to this chord. Now, whether it means that I'm going to put a D on top, that's the only thing I can think of. Here, this first quarter note D is in parenthesis, and then there are only three beats left, so it, it looks like I would have had a rest there, but... Hmm. I think what's implicit from this one is it's the top note. But, what I ask? sorry. Right. Look, that's a familiar kind of notation I did. Oh. Um... Just augment in parentheses. Oh yes, that means it's, uh, that, yeah, that just means yeah, exactly means a uh, double, uh, you know, uh, take e each uh, uh, um, rhythmic uh, 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 duration and double it. That's all that means. Okay. In other words, it's an alternate accompaniment. Then instead of going mm, da da, I might go bum bum bum. Todd's breakdown, epiphany. Oh yeah. Um, in your sketches here, there, there were just a, a few things that intrigued me. Um, here you say, or it looks like, or D flat five for, for exaltation. exaltation. Right. Obviously, I uh, I think because we're in the key of D flat, you know, when when you hit when you hit a five uh, after you've been building up things. And this is a two chord, and the two chord is like like a, a, a mild subs, a, a mild version of a five. You know, a two chord doesn't have that that immediate uh, 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 need to be resolved into a one. It usually goes to a five. Or, but a two chord, 
uh, at, particularly as is used in a lot of songwriting, is really a five on the second inversion. That's all it is, you know. And, and so in this case, instead of being an A-flat bass for a five sound, it's an E-flat bass, but it's the same chord. I mean, I'm, I've got some dissonances there, but essentially, as, as we were talking yesterday, the bass line, if it's the, if it's the two, then it's not as strong a pull as it is to the A. So for exaltation, I think what probably, usually for exaltation, they use 6-4 chords. And I have, uh, over the years, I've used 6-4s less and less and less and less because there's something slightly corny about hitting your climax on a 6-4. And so I tend to hit it on a 5 now and go just straight to the 5 instead of going 6-4 and 5. And um, uh, so uh, when I plot a piece like this, which requires a certain emotional journey for the, the character and the performer, I like to sort of know where I'm going to end, not just lyrically, but musically. Uh, how, you know, will it be a big statement of the theme at the beginning? Will it be a, a chordal hold? Yeah, that sort of thing. And um, you'll notice that, that up here I, I have this thing of the work, the work, because I thought his insanity would be wonderful if I could somehow make it so that Sweeney thought that he now knew what he should do in the world, which is to kill everybody. And that it, in his mind it was work. It was like Michelangelo doing the Sistine Chapel. It, it was his calling. And unfortunately, and the word work is great if it's a speech, but sing the word work and you are in serious trouble, which is why there are rests there. And it doesn't have the feeling of climax. If you're going and going and going, you're the work. The work, it just doesn't, you know, it was the work, you could do it. But holding that, that, that ER sound in work is not a good thing. So obviously I, I opted not to do that. But clearly what I'm trying to arrive at here is what is the climax of the piece. I had this little counter theme, ja da 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 and I, I could feel that because that's the kind of, 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 of motif that you can build and build and build and think of how you can get da 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 It's like Ravel, it's like Dawn in, 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 in uh, um, Daphnis and Chloe. And uh, obviously I, I, I try to find what kind of chord I wanted to reach for the big statement of his yearning for his dead wife that would lead into the work, the work, the work. All for naught. All for naught. Not all for naught. All right. An urgent march theme. Um, well, I, eventually what that, yes, because I wanted, I wanted that thing of, the whole point of this piece is to, you're dealing with a schizophrenic personality at, the, at this time. He, he alternates between his fury of the world and his yearning for his dead wife and his frustration at just having been cheated of his revenge. And since the show is about revenge, it's the major thing. It's like, it's like Othello discovering the handkerchief. I mean, it's the same thing. And uh, so I thought, what I gotta do is find a way of holding a piece together where a guy is going to go through the three faces of Eve. He's gotta keep switching personalities, and yet it's gotta somehow hold together and not just be a tapeworm. And uh, uh, this theme, uh, 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 turned out to be extremely useful uh, throughout. I'm not sure whether this arises from an earlier theme or not. I can't remember at the moment, and I don't want to take tape time. But um, uh, it, it, uh, it, it became, I thought, all right, what is the climax? Is it, it's his determining that he's going to ki uh, kill everybody, and it should have, it should be a passionate declaration like, like love or something like that. But for the anger, I wanted... I wanted to use a chugging sound, and that's what this is, an attempt to find a chug. Yo, dum, 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 dum. And then I got the idea of utilizing the DA series here. So that you get the DA series and you come in. Yum, bum, 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 bum. And once I got that, I didn't need this. But this is an attempt to find, I just thought the urgency is a march. It's chunk, 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 chunk. It's not really a march, but I mean, you can't march it, but it's a, it's a chug theme. It's a it's 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 a steady four. It's a steady four, and every every beat has the same emphasis, so that you feel um, it's locomotive or something like that. So march is not really the word for it, but you know I'm doing shorthand here to get the stuff sure. on paper. So, but that that's the idea, and what that became is the DACRA statement. In a case like this, is the music. Internal or external is the, the 
does the music help drive him mad, or is no. it a reflection of Reflec his madness? Reflection. I, it never has occurred to me that the, the music affects the character. I don't think it's ever occurred to me. No, to me, always songwriting. Uh, I'll think about that now, but always, always. You know, I'm, really, like he's I, hearing I, I am, voices I'm, or something. No, no, no. I'm, 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 the... I'm characterizing uh, mood. Okay. You know, I'm characterizing urgency. That I'm characterizing tenderness. That I'm characterizing anger. That I'm, you know, it's you know, it's playwriting as opposed to you know, the, 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 in a scene, the uh, the characters not get affected by the words. The words come out, get affected by the character. Um, ladies and their sensitivities. Oh, yeah. Um, just your sketch here at the top, V, G, C, H, I assume it's verse in G, chorus in D. Very good. Absolutely correct. Um, the, the, yeah, go ahead. The plotting of that, do you remember what would make you... G, D, uh, well, no, I, uh, no, I don't really know why I would... Uh, why I want to go G D dum bum bum bum? Because that sounds to me like one of my reductions again, where I'm reflecting something in the theme and vice versa. That the, uh, uh, in other words, the tonicization of G and then the tonicization of D and then the, then each one of those going up a tone has some kind of significance. I notice that the beginning of the um, uh, accompaniment figure is an open fifth, but then it all, often is. So, I'm, so that doesn't, that's, that's irrelevant. Um, why would I pick G and D and then A and E? Well, of course, first of all, it turns out to be A. Well, that's because probably I raised the key in writing it. And then after A, after the key signature goes to D, but you know, ladies and their sensitivities doesn't have a, a, a very tonal feeling to it, so. Well, you're going to hear the D there. But it now seems to me as if, as if it goes A, D, as opposed to a fifth. It looks like I changed it and went up to a fourth. So, Do you remember I, how you came up with the 5-8 for this? It's no, I don't. Um, again, no. Because I, 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 I don't write a lot of fives and sevens. Uh, no, I don't. I think, again, probably what happened was the score was starting to feel square to me. That's a guess. And starting to feel like it was compounded too much of twos, fours, and threes. Uh, that's a guess. That this, what this is is instinctive reaching for variety. It certainly has no uh, dramatic significance. Um, um, Again, I, I'm very concerned always with writing conversational songs. And conversation tends not to be a square as two, three, and four. Conversation tends to divide itself up into, into units of two, three, four, and five, and six, and seven. And um, since this is a very conversational song, as opposed to a statement song, I think that may have led me to that. That's the best I can offer. One of the things that I've wondered about this song is I understand dramatically the point of the song is to get the judge to go see Sweeney. But why the why ladies and their sensitivities? Why not him have a toothache and that's it, oh I know this great guy to pull teeth or what was well, it about the idea of oh, ladies and their sensitivities? Oh no 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 really no no because the judge is trying to make himself attractive to his niece. Uh, to, to his ward, he's trying to be sexy. He's trying to make her like it. So it's all about, you don't look delicious enough, sir. The, the beetle knows that, that the, the judge says, it, it's, the whole thing starts with the judge announcing that he intends to ask his right. ward okay. to marry him. And the beetle says, oh, but sir, you, you really, you know, you, you look a little, little slovenly and, and you need to shave. Uh, the toothache wouldn't have anything to do with that. Because it, uh, that's about so it's more than just plot of getting him there. Oh. It's actually yeah. Well, there's more to it than it. that. The real plot is that the, that Anthony and uh, Joanna are making love, are about to make love in uh, in the judge's house. And what I'd hoped, and unfortunately because of the uh, abstract aspect of the set, uh, there was no suspense. But I wanted the audience to be in suspense and ha watch him going home and be about to enter his house when they're making love or about to make love, and then being. Uh, 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 digressed by, by diverted by the Beatle, to go that way and go to the go to the barber shop. Um, if this were a movie, and I hope it will be, I would try to m convince the director to make this a, a suspense sequence in which you have 
the young couple about to be discovered by the villain and killed, and, um, and at the last moment diverted because of vanity. So the point is that the Beatles uh, harping on the judge's vanity and the judge, and that's what that opening speech meant to me that, that Hugh wrote about, I've, you know, I'm, uh, I, I've decided to, to uh, uh, offer my award, uh, I'm going to uh, offer my award marriage, and I'm going to bring her a little gift, and it was a strange, um, you know, or he's proposed to her, and anyway, he's tends to marry her money, he's already proposed to her, and she's been horrified. So uh, the whole uh, 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 aspect of the judge's attractiveness to a young girl, this middle-aged lecher's attractiveness, is the key, so that's why it's about. Along the same line, the parlor songs, Sweet Polly Plunkett, Tower of Bray, what was it, why those songs? Were I, just want, I just wanted, the, the, the moment in, in Chris Bond's script when the, actually that's the scene that I wanted to, to transform into a trio, uh, into, a, into a, 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 a duet where she's trying to poison him and, and, and she's mm -hmm. going to poison herself. The point is, the plot calls for, his to come, calls for him to come into the place when she isn't there and then she discovers him and gets completely panicky. So that's the plot. So I thought, all right, what's he going to do? Well, of course he could just uh, uh, come into the room and shout and, and sit, or, uh, sit around or, or yell for her or something like that. But it's a musical, so, you know, and there's the harmonium there. Also, there wasn't anything for the Beatles to sing in the second act. And that's an important character, and I thought, here's a chance to get him to sing. And um, at the time, I didn't know we were going to get a countertenor like Jack. It was just going to be a high voice, but not a countertenor. But particularly after we, uh, I'd already written the songs, but particularly after we'd hired Jack, I was glad because I wanted, uh, you know, wanted to give him a chance. Well, to Well, not off. so much the fact of the songs, oh. but why folk songs? Well, no, not even why folk songs, but why those folk songs? Oh, is, I, there, is there any? Oh, why did I choose those know, titles? The Tower of Bray. Was it? Did you want the? There's a sort of bells that go through the score, and you wanted no. I went I'm through just, a book of English folk songs and tried to, <laughs> okay. try to figure out. All right, do okay. one about a, a maiden, and then do one about a, a something that has many choruses, like a, 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 a oranges and lemons, the bells of St. Clements. That's okay. really what that is. It's one of those songs where I thought the fun of it is it's got to be a song where he gets her to agree to sing with him, and then there turn out to be endless verses, and she doesn't know okay. how to get rid of them. That's a, also, there was to be much more of it. Uh, when I said trio earlier, when she poisons him, I mean, if I'd written that, the idea was that it will also be a trio with, with Toby in the basement so that we would have a, a, the three voices going at once. I still wanted to use Toby in the basement. I thought, all right, the way to make this more functional is that they sing a song that Toby knows, so Toby starts singing from the basement, and in the distance, the Beatle hears this other voice joining in and says, what was that? Oh, it was just the wind. Oh, you know, one of those scenes. And uh, it's, it's got to be a classic melodrama scene. And um, so I wanted something that sounded like the kind of song that you sit around singing, and then you go into verse after verse after verse after verse after verse. So that's why I called for two songs. The Beatle comes in, he sits, and sings something for himself. Then he says, why don't you join in? And she says, oh, all right, because she's trapped. And, of course, it's now a song that Toby knows. So the second song is the danger song in which she's panicky because he's going to hear the voice in the cellar and then go down and discover him, blah, 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 blah. And they get interrupted by Sweeney just in time. It's not under what we were planning to do here, but since you raised it, the, the idea of a film of Sweeney... Oh, well, uh, Tim Burton uh, apparently fell in love with the show when he was in London and saw it in 1981 and uh, saw it apparently ten times and um, wants to do it, wants to do it, wants to do it. So at the moment, that's where it's, it's under contract to, uh, it's been optioned by Columbia, I think it's Columbia. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Burton still wants to do it, although I now hear he's doing Superman 12 and so on. <laughs> You stated before that you think usually film musicals don't work unless they're sort of the Astaire Rogers style or something Absolutely. like that. Do you, do, you, can, do you conceive of Sweeney as being something that could work? I don't think it? it's going to work for two seconds. <laughs> this is not to be shown until 1999, uh, not until 2099. Okay. Um, no, I, I don't know. You know, the only time a, 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 a musical on the screen has ever been, well, it's sung through because of a little opera, is the medium. Uh, but I, and, and oh no, there's the umbrellas of Cherbourg, which I uh, don't think worked for a second. But um, uh, no, I, I, 
It's just his enthusiasm, and I thought, well, why not try? What's to lose? I have discovered, I used to think that if you put out a bad movie of the show, it'll, it'll hurt the show, but it doesn't. I won't mention chapter and verse, but there have been many, many bad movies and musicals, and the musicals still keep playing in summer stock, and you know, so it doesn't hurt. Well, I can mention one, because all the people are dead and won't hurt anybody. Guys and Dolls, a terrible movie musical, hasn't hurt the show one ounce. So, so if, if this works, then I'm wrong, and I'll eat, I'll eat my words happily. And if it doesn't work, I'll say, yes, see, well, I told you so. <laughs> so I can't lose. You can't lose. The last box of Sweeney. Okay. Um, final scene. Mm. Um, you've discussed before. I don't. I don't know if it, in here or not, but that part of the point of the score is Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney's themes clashing Classic. at the end here. Um, and I. I particularly section. like your, your note at the top here, if you want to sort of read that out loud. Oh, this is to the copyist, who was a, a, a sweet lady, but very square, and her name was Maddie. I said, Maddie, I know this looks weird, but it's the, it's the clearest layout I can think of. The idea was to have, you know, as, uh, two, two songs that have nothing to do with each other going together. And one is in five eight and six eight. I mean, one one is one is one uh, rhythm. Uh, one is one meter, and the other is the other. And in order to make it clear to the singer, I arbitrarily divided things into five eight and six eight, so I could draw lines down, so the singers would know where to come in. Actually, it did not take Angie very long to learn this. And um, uh, and you know, Angie is very musical, but she's not a, a really experienced singer of of stuff like this. And I thought, oh my God, it's going to be so hard for her to learn. Not at all. And it's partly because if each singer sticks to his or her last, it's very clear. In other words, if you just sing her part, it's very easy to do. It's, you've got to turn your ear off to what the other person is singing. That's the, that's, that's the trick. So actually, this is not a very complex passage. It's, it's, the, it's the rhythmic equivalent of polytonality. You know, it's, it's, it's Mio putting the right hand in E flat and the, and the left hand in E. Uh, and e each each one is simple in itself. It's just when they clash, it makes for dissonance. So this is you know very simple-minded dissonance, and it's just on paper. Maddie having you know s uh, copied so many scores in which if the if the vocal is in four is four four, then the accompaniment is in four four. I just thought if I do it the way I would ordinarily do it, which is dotted lines. Um, well, there is a dotted line here. That's that's to show show where the downbeat is. Um, she'll go crazy, so I devised this method. I will tell you, a friend of mine who has conducted this and told me it was a nightmare to conduct the section. Um, I don't know if that, does that ever occur to you, or do well, you think about the No, I don't know why it should be, because the accompaniment is fairly square. I guess trying to cue in the singer ah, answer for that. that's the point. Something. If the singer is insecure, of course there's a problem. I don't think Paul ever had to cue Angie in. Okay. Once she started, she went. You know, once she got the downbeat, she went. I don't remember him having to, to do that at all. I'll ask, oh, you could ask him yourself. I, I don't remember that. I don't think he had trouble. First of all, he would have told me. He, he would have come to me and said, look, could we simplify or something like that? Because, you know, he would always defer to the performer in something like that. I mean, uh, not that he would distort the music, but he'd try to, as he, as he does with registers, he would come to me and say, look, this is difficult for her. Is there anything you can do? Have you considered this or something like that? And of course, you know, you're writing for performance. I almost always defer, which incidentally is not true of Lenny, for example. When, when we wrote West Side, he was de bound and determined that Tony should sing a high C in the obligato section of Maria. And the only people we could find to play Tony who could sing a high C were fat tenors who were 40 years old and from operetta and opera. And Lenny actually tried to push one of them on us, and, and it was just ridiculous. And we ended up with Larry Kurt, who, when he started to sing the show, his top note was an F. He was primarily a lyric baritone. He was not a tenor. And Tony had been conceived as a tenor. We could not find any. Also, as you know, tenors tend to speak on the stage like, like capons, you know, and it's, it's uh, 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 difficult uh, to, to find one, particularly if you're going to ask him to, to, to be a gang leader. And um, so we ended up with a lyric baritone. And Larry, when he entered the show, sang up to an F. And when he finished, he sang up to an A. The high C is still written as an alternate in the score, but Lenny agreed to relax and let, let Tony just go up to an F or an A. 
He did not do the same thing in A Boy Like That, and Carol Lawrence was forced to sing higher than her voice because he wouldn't make that compromise. And you can hear on the record, she goes into a squeak at the top and well, of a once in your life. And now granted, in subsequent performances and subsequent productions, they find ladies who can do that, which is great, so maybe Lenny was correct in doing it. So the same thing is true here. I could have simplified this, but I thought if Angie can handle it, then she can handle it. You know, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of how much do you ma demand of a performance? If Angie couldn't have handled this, I would have simplified it. I would, because you got to defer to the performer. Did, since you write chronologically, and this is the very end of the show, did, did you know from the very beginning that this moment was going to be about the clash of those themes? No, I just theater? knew that I was going to have a clash. I didn't know that it was going to... I, actually, I, had, I think I conceived of it as a sort of duet. And I decided, you know something? If it's a duet, then they're together. Just the fact that two voices are together implies that they're together. But the whole idea is, she's thinking one thing and he's thinking another. And they have different agendas. And you've got, you know, he's intending to kill her, and she's intending to marry him. And those are called, I mean, in some instances, in some, <laughs> it's the same, but um, not in this one. And, um, uh, and, uh, and so, and her, also, I wanted to echo her nervousness. She knows something's wrong. She knows she's made a slight mistake by not telling him that he's killed his wife, and that the woman he killed was his wife. And so she knows she's made a slight error. So she's a little nervous. And he is like that. Well, if you have a guy like that and a lady who's nervous, how do you put the two things together? Answer, you don't. You just have them occur simultaneously. This was so easy to write because I didn't have to do any work. It's just, you sing your part, darling. You sing your part, darling. I don't care whether you're together or not. The whole point is, don't be together. So this was always oh, hard to notate. It was not hard to write. And worked like a... Oh, worked like a dream because... Only, and suddenly, it worked like a dream because of the two hours that preceded it. 